we have two speakers today. First, let me introduce John Dugan, Adventist Risk Management Senior Risk Control Specialist. John has a wealth of knowledge about safety and has helped to form the inspection tools we will be talking about today. Hi, John. How are you, David? Good. Also joining us is Arthur Blincy, our Chief Risk Management Officer. Welcome back, Arthur. Thank you, David. Good to be here. Let me just go ahead and turn the program right over to you. Thank you, David. You know, for many years, Adventist Risk Management has been promoting church safety officers in a number of our conferences across North America. And one of the key elements of a effective church safety officer program is that these team members at the local church perform site surveys. So John, I guess the thing we'd really like to learn today is why are self inspections of church properties so important to that local safety program? I think David pretty much said it in the in the intro, Arthur. Uh, you know, it's important that we identify the risk exposures and the hazardous conditions that can result in injuries and, and property losses at our churches. Uh, that in turn, um, those kind of losses and injuries can hinder the church's ability to accomplish its mission. Um, and, and mission's important. That's what churches are there for. Um, there are a multitude of challenges in trying to do that, and, and to some, I think, you know, the church safety officer can sometimes find that the doing a self-inspection can be a bit daunting. Um, after all, the church has a multitude of risk exposures that go everywhere from administrative issues to property and fire exposures and other dangerous conditions like poorly maintained property or buildings, um, electrical hazards and things that might be on the property. Maybe there's questionable security. And then, of course, there's personal injury exposures like slips, trips, and falls, and activity and child supervision and safety. Oh, slow down, John. Wait, wait a minute here. You expect a local church safety officer to try to identify all of those types of exposures at a local church? I mean, I sure hope that there's some tools that these people can use to accomplish this task. Uh, is there anything that Adventist Risk Management has provided for these individuals? I mean, they are just volunteers. They're not regular paid employees of the conference. Arthur, I'm glad you asked. Um, and in fact, we have a new tool, a set of tools that have just come out. Um, we have available on our website now a church safety and self-inspection guide um, that's been written sort of an explanatory guide to help the church safety officer and others understand the common hazards or exposures uh, for a particular area of the church. And we're starting it in the parking lot where you arrive at the church, um, then you move into various areas inside the church as you go through in this guide. I think uh, it'll be a very valuable in, in helping to explain what hazards are there, why they're, you know, what we're afraid of and, and what, what needs to be fixed to help them meet their goals. To do that, we've provided another self, a church safety self-inspection form, um, which can be used in a variety of ways. It can be used as a hard copy, or it could even be used as a fillable PDF on a tablet or a, uh, a pad of some kind, an iPad. Um, and in using it, I think the church safety officer will find that uh, it's it's fairly simple. I mean, a no response, if, if you look at the question and you answer no to what the question says, it means you've probably got a problem there that needs to be addressed. Um, so you just kind of describe what the issue is and, and what the recommended action is for that particular item. Now, John, I've seen these new tools that you've just referred to, and, and they are very exciting because I believe that if a church safety officer just takes a little bit of time by using the uh, safety site survey guide to introduce themselves to the various types of exposures that he's going to find or she's going to find at the church, uh, it will give them a road map. And I must also say that this new church safety self-inspection form is so user-friendly compared to the old one. Uh, not only is it a little bit shorter, but it's easy to use 
they can maintain it on an electronic file basis on their personal computer. They can email the results to uh, other individuals at the local church, their church board members, the conference office. And it's really going to be, I think, a usable tool in the hands of our church safety officers, unlike anything they've ever had before. But John, you still went through a long list of exposures. And I would hope that you can unpack these and give us some real life examples of what is the local church safety officer going to see as they start to walk through their facilities. Okay, let's, let's do that. I'm going to begin with talking about uh, the first section that you'll find in the, in the fillable form and in the guide, which is administrative issues. Safety really begins here. It, it begins with the direction and backing of the, from the church administration. Um, in fact, they must assist in the creation of the various policies and procedures that we expect um, in, a, in a typical church. Um, unlike the cracked sidewalk or electrical outlet that you see hanging out of a wall, it's going to be less visual. Uh, it's one of those times where we have to actually ask questions of the church administrators, the pastors, whoever's in charge uh, are of, of these items. Um, as, as we go through it. And I'm not going to list all those administrative issues, just like I'm not going to talk about all of the things that are on the form, although it is a much abbreviated form. Um, and, and I think you'll find it very usable out there. One question, John, in the administrative area. I sort of think, shouldn't the church safety officer be a member of the local church board as well? It's it's a good idea if the church officer is in there and, and it gets that board recognition and, and uh, it provides some teeth into actually being able to accomplish a lot of what needs to be done and, and making sure that the board's not left in the dark about some of the exposures that are there. Good, good point. I hope that all of our local church safety officers are members and actively involved in their local church boards. Yeah, and on the church board, you also have people like the building directors and things that are responsible for pushing money for some of the repairs and things. And it's just a very useful place for the safety officer to be. One of the other topics that we'll talk about real quick is, is church protection. Elements under the church protection are, are crucial in the prevention of property losses and, and very critical to life safety in our church, which is a very important item. Um, you know, we're looking at things like if we have sprinkler systems, are those sprinkler systems being tested uh, annually? Are our fire extinguishers not tampered with and, and, and serviced annually? Uh, somebody should actually go through the church monthly and look to make sure that somebody hasn't pulled a um, seal loose on a, an extinguisher and fired it off playing around with them. It does happen. And an extinguisher that's been, been fired is not going to be any use in an actual emergency situation. Do we have smoke and heat detectors in critical areas like our mechanical rooms and our kitchens? Do we have fire alarm systems in our church? How do we evacuate if we haven't got a fire alarm system? You know, maybe if a church doesn't have one, there may be another th method that's going to have to be used, but that can, that can be addressed uh, by the individual churches if they're small enough to where they just make an announcement, you know, leave the building. Um, do we have security systems and good lighting? You know, those are some of those exposures out there that uh, we need to be aware of. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors where we have fossil fuel heating or fossil fuel stoves, those kind of things. Nowadays, more and more codes are requiring that we have carbon monoxide detectors in our facilities for that. And what about our flammable storage? I, I go into buildings I know periodically and I'll see where there's flammables in a utility, in a utility mechanical room. Uh, there's nothing worse than having fumes in some place that's uh, generating sparks um, that, that could end up burning your church down. You know, John, I like the fact that you actually are helping the safety officer walk through their facility. Now, I know that the safety uh, inspection guide starts in the parking lot, which I think is the next area you really want us to cover. Yeah, I tried to actually bring the guide together to where, hey, we drive up to the church, we get out of our vehicles, what's the first things we see? I know that's what I'm going to see the first time I drive up to a facility is is things like potholes in, in parking lots that, that may be there. 
Um, slips, trips, and falls are the most common accident practically for anybody in the world. Um, and so it, it's very important that we identify where somebody can, can trip, fall, slip, um, and, and get those items fixed. Um, and it starts in the church parking lot. Uh, I see many that have large cracks or, or potholes or maybe the curbing where the vehicle pulls in is busted and there's a piece of steel sticking out the side. Um, we have cracks or elevated sidewalks because tree roots have pushed sidewalks up or, or maybe the sidewalk has settled um, and which leaves a, an inch gap for people to stumble on. And then sometimes it's just normal debris that comes down from, from trees because of the wind uh, and so we get these leaves and, and pieces of limb or children playing in, in places where uh, they have gravel and bark alongside a sidewalk. They kick all of this onto the sidewalk. It's very easily easy to stumble and fall on those kind of things. And it's important that we try to keep those cleaned up. And then we have weather-related issues to deal with in the grounds. I mean, outside, we're going to get snow. We're going to get ice. Uh, we need to make sure that we keep that cleaned up um, and and melted off and, and shoveled and whatever it takes to make sure that we have a good safe walking zone. And if there's one thing I, I like to mention everywhere I go is if you're walking up a set of steps and you stumble and you have nothing to grab, where are you going to go? You're going to go falling on your face. Um, so it, I really find it's, it's very important to make sure that there's handrails on every set of steps we have. Um, it, it's just, it, it helps people. There's a lot of us, there are a lot of folks that, that may need some extra assistance and that hand roll provides it as they try to get up or down stairs. So inside or out, handrails are, are a very, very important element. So what kind of things would we find inside a building that could cause a slip or fall? Well, as you go inside, I, I know sometimes I've actually stepped right into a doorway and the first thing I do is, is you know, want to wipe my feet off on the mat because I don't, I don't want to track something in that's going to be slippery either. Uh, but I have been in some facilities where I walked in and, and they didn't have a regular rubber gripped mat with a tapered edge that, you know, so you don't stumble on it. They actually put down towels. Now, if anybody stepped on a towel that's on a, a tile floor that's wet, um, it's a very startling feeling to suddenly find that your feet are starting to go out from under you as you surf on this towel across the floor. Um, so, you know, we're trying to make sure that we have non-slip rugs and mats there. And what's the condition of our floor surfacing? As our carpeting started to wrinkle in our facilities, it's easy to stumble on that. Shoes catch on it very easily. What about our tile? Is it chipped or cracked or in some other way uh, defective? We also may find that people have run cords. It may be temporarily, but they may have run cords across the floor. And in doing so, they create a tripping hazard. Now you can temporarily tape those down if you like, if you have to have something just temp very temporary. But remember too that that cord underneath there is going to get damaged. If there's a better way to run it so it's not across uh, an aisle or a walkway, that's, that's the best way to go. Storage is the same way. I've seen places where it's, it'd be very, it's hard to walk down a hall because there's boxes and different things stored in them, um, which, which can cause these falls. And again, uh, just, it's just as important on the inside that a set of steps have a handrail inside. Um, and you're going to find as you talk about egress how critical that is that, that as you look at your exit doors, um, that are, is there a handrail? Because People are going to be really in a hurry if they're in an emergency situation trying to get out, and they're going to need that extra assistance. You know, John, it's interesting you bring that up because whenever I go into a church facility on Sabbath or during the week, how we get people in and out of the church is so critical to the life safety of our church members, our children, and our guests. So what are some of the life safety concerns that you see at our churches? Well, you'll see on your form as you look at it uh, when you download them and things that, uh, you know, I've really highlighted a lot of the, the things that sometimes scare me when I'm out there and, and going through churches. 
Um, it's very important that exit doors remain unlocked and that they're not chained and padlocked when that building's occupied. I have seen chains on doors um, when I've been in, in facilities. I've seen doors that, that are keyed locked and uh, when they're exit egress doors, they can't have those kind of devices on there. It's, it's important that people can get out immediately. And doors have to swing in the direction of exit travel. Every once in a while I find a door that's listed as an exit door and it swings in instead of out. So you can imagine what it would be like with a crowd of people pushing against it to try and pull that door open and, and get out of there. Um, therefore, when you have a door and it swings out, you have panic hardware on it that you know, all it takes is a little bit of a push against it. That panic hard door where allows the door to fly open and, and people can get out. Exit signage is also important. Uh, I, I do go in facilities now and then and while there'll be exit signs in many cases, in most cases, over the doors, they are there. Um, not always. Every once in a while I find one that isn't or I find one that needs to be repaired. Uh, because it's not working properly. I also find other places in churches like corridors or things that you're not sure where that exit door is. Where do I go to? Um, and sometimes we have to go beyond just the exit signs over the doors and put in some additional signs that lead people to those exit doors. Um, egress maps are, are very important in, in facilities so um, everybody that's inside can get familiarized with where where is my primary exit, where do I go, which will be part of the emergency plan that a church would have. And what if that I can't get to that door, then where's my secondary exit at? So the maps are very useful in that regard. Again, it's very important that aisles be kept clear. Um, you can see in the picture on the slide uh, that was that was an actual condition observed in the facility I was in. Um, another thing that I want to mention uh, before I change topics is that lighting and how important lighting is in a facility for a lot of reasons. Number one, security, um, but also again, so people can see changes in elevation so they can see where they're walking and help prevent those slip and fall accidents that occur, those trip and fall accidents. You know, the egress issue is probably the thing that concerns me the most, John, because human nature is such we're going to try to leave the building the same way we came in and if those exits are blocked because of the fire it's so critical that the secondary exits aren't obstructed in some way so that the congregation can still evacuate that building now we have some very small children at our churches in the cradle roll divisions nurseries and so on are there any hazards in those areas Ah, mother's rooms, yes. Um, first thing I usually look at in the mother's room when I walk in is making sure that there's safety caps in electrical outlets if they're there. Um, not every mother's room has electrical outlets, but the biggest share of them do. Um, and little kids have this propensity for picking up something small, bobby pin or whatever it happens to be, and sticking it in those little holes they see in the walls. And uh, so we need to make sure that we've got safety caps in those. Um, we also, if there's sinks, there's, if there's a little bathroom in a sink, we need to make sure that it's got ground fault protection near the sink in case something gets plugged into it. We don't want electrical devices dropping into a wet sink. Um, infant change tables, I sometimes will see pads that are just laying loose on top of a counter um, instead of being secured to it. That infant, infant table needs to be secured down. It needs to have a safety strap on it so that they can strap the child down. Um, and there should be really written instructions there that defines use the strap that's on this. A lot of times I'll see that strap tucked in and people aren't using using the strap. You can tell just the way the way it's set up. Um, so having some good signage there about always keeping a hand on the child and, and having the child strapped down is, is very, very important. Cribs are another thing. This crib that you see in the picture here was actually taken at a church I went into. Um, churches and or cribs are very, um, can be very dangerous, especially the drop side cribs and, and have been responsible for strangulation and other injuries with, with young children. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, at cpsc.gov has a lot of useful information on cribs um, and it's very important that we don't have cribs in our facilities and you can see online 
what's what's current, what's where the hazards are, which ones are should be in there, which ones shouldn't. As you can see in this one, this was even if it had been an acceptable crib uh, when it was in good shape, it was it's certainly not an acceptable crib now uh, with the condition it's in. You know, are there hazardous chemicals in there, um, spills and leaks? But you know, mothers sometimes a uh, baby bottle can get spilled on a floor. Um, well, you know, you may not want to cry over spilt milk, but trust me, if you slip and fall in it, somebody might. So we, we definitely want, don't want those either. Okay, John, as we keep going through the church, as Adventists, there's one very important spot as it relates to the mission. And that's when we bring a new believer into the baptismal tank. Are there any hazards there? Probably the scariest hazard I sometimes see in baptismal tanks is microphones within reach of the people in the tank. We have actually lost pastors through electrocution in a baptismal tank, and most recently another denomination lost one uh, within the last couple of years in Texas as a pastor reached out, grabbed a hold of a microphone, and was electrocuted in the tank. Um, there's also other things that could be near that tank besides their microphone, and that includes things like lighting and stuff that, that can be reached at and touched and, and if they're, you know, it just, if there's a short or something, then again, you can have an electrocution. Slips and falls are also very, uh, happen, occur a lot in, in tanks. So it's important that there also that we provide railings into that tank. Um, you can see, you'll see on your list other issues that are critical there. I won't go into all of them during this talk. I know that probably the scariest part of the church is when you go and you open up the janitor's closet door or the door to the mechanical room and you sometimes as a risk manager just shake your head. What do we find there? Yes, mechanical rooms can be very scary. I've seen everything from flammable cleaners in, in mechanical rooms to propane tanks to lawn mowers with gas fumes wafting around. Um, mechanical rooms are not made for storage. It's very important that we keep storage out of mechanical rooms. And, and I won't go through everything on this list again. You'll see them as you look at your forms, but we need to make sure that we keep storage out of there. Because if you're storing in there, you also have people in the mechanical room you don't want in the mechanical room. So it's also critical that we keep those doors around mechanical rooms locked. They should be fire rated doors, but they should be locked to keep people out that don't have any, any uh, authorization to be in those rooms. Housekeeping is very important. And there's clearances you'll see as you look at your form that have to be maintained in front of electrical panel blocks. It's three feet of clear space. Um, one of the other things we see in mechanical rooms and throughout churches is poke throughs. Um, people put in holes to run pipes and plumbing through and duct work and they don't seal back up around those. So if there's a fire in the mechanical room, fire and products of smoke, they'll all come back out into the other area and possibly affect egress from that facility. So we want to make sure we take care of those kinds of issues. Now, John, I remember once you did a presentation on managing potluck risk. Now, come on. How could there be risk at a Adventist potluck? Well, you'll see on our forum we, we barely even touch or address on on food itself uh, that deal with potlucks. But there's lots of physical risks that we do address and we look at. Uh, one of those being make, making sure that we allow plenty of room between tables and and making creating aisles so people can exit there if they have to in a hurry. Um, it's making sure, as you can see, there's there's a couple of pictures there, tables stacked against walls. Uh, we've had some very serious injuries from tables falling over and chairs falling over onto kids. In this case, we even had an attractive nuisance next to the tables. Um, little kids that would be attracted to that, that little toy would end up possibly knocking a table over on themselves. You also have the big slip and fall exposures there. There's, food all over the place, there's liquids all over the place, are we prepared to make sure we've got signage and mops and, and things to where we can jump right on it when somebody has a spill and get that mopped up before we end up with a serious injury? Well, you know, John, you've sure covered a lot of exposures today. And if 
I was a church safety officer. I guess my question to you would be, what are the top three exposures when I am doing a site inspection should I always keep in mind? When I look at top three, I, my biggest concern is, is generally for life safety. Lives are, are critical. I mean, yes, I don't want to have to replace a building and have other damage occur, but we can replace buildings, and, but we can't replace people. And people are the makeup of our churches, so we have to make sure that we properly protect them and we take care of them. It's our Christian duty to take care of people. Um, so life safety is my number one. The slips, trips, and falls, because of its propensity, and it happens all of the time everywhere, that's at the top of my list too, is just trying to prevent those kinds of losses. And you'll, as you go through your churches, you'll see these kind of things all over the place that could, could cause that. And finally, probably I would look at, because of the number of things that can cause them, is fire safety and making sure that uh, we've done everything we can to try and prevent fires. We cannot complete our mission without a church or people. Well, I think that's great advice. Now, John, I know that these forms have just become available. And I know that our church safety officers are going to be anxious to use them. Every conference who's established their own church safety officer program will probably have different requirements as to uh, do they want the local church safety officer to submit a completed report to the conference office so that they know that this church inspection has taken place. And as we said before, the form is such that they can be signed, uh, they can then be electronically transmitted to the conference office, and we certainly hope that it will be a real useful tool in the hands of our local church safety officers. And so where can we find these tools? Well, we want to invite our audience tonight to visit our website, www.adventistrisk.org. And when they come to the home page, they'll see right in the center right-hand corner a button called Prevention. And if they click on that button, they will take them into all the prevention resources that we have here at Adventist Risk Management. And they'll see there's an icon there for churches. And if they click on Church Resources, all of these forms will be right there in a drop-down menu that they can select, download to their computer, and start to use. So, John, we want to thank you today for this guidance that you've given us and walking us through how to do a local church safety inspection. And we really hope that our church safety officers will use these tools to do self-inspections that can really make a difference in safety at their local church. Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, John and, and Arthur for sharing with us today.